Hello everyone and welcome back to this nanophotonics and plasmonics course. Uh, today we're going to cover chapter 6 on photonic crystals. Uh, but before diving into the realm of photonic crystals, I wanted to show you some numerical simulations uh, that we illustrate the uh, light matter interactions and more specifically light scattering processes. So those simulations uh, that I'm going to show you uh, have been performed using the finite difference time domain method, uh, which we will detail in chapter seven. Uh, so the first one, uh, we have one single silicon nanoparticle, and we're going to send uh, an incoming plane wave onto the silicon nanoparticle. The frequency of this plane wave is set to be at 400 terahertz, uh, which corresponds to a wavelength of uh, 750 nanometers. So this is into the, the near infrared region. Uh, so what happens when you send this incoming plane wave on this nanoparticle, uh, then you're going to basically obtain some uh, forward scattering and backward scattering. Uh, so the forward scattering and backward scattering uh, is uh, something which is well known. Uh, so this light scattering from a single nanoparticle uh, is something very trivial uh, to address and understand. And we're going to discuss that uh, also for, uh, later on uh, when discussing about plasmonics. Now, what happens if you have multiple nanoparticles randomly distributed? Like here, you have 10 nanoparticles made of silicon. You send the exact same incoming plane wave that we propagate through space. And now each nanoparticle will actually uh, scatter light uh, successively. So the light scattered from each individual nanoparticle will... Uh, overlap with uh, the scatter field from the other nanoparticles uh, and as well from uh, the incoming plane wave and we result in uh, to this uh, very complex uh, spatial field distribution. Uh, so the spatial field distribution is just the result of multiple scattering processes that occur uh, in this ensemble of nanoparticles. So then here you see that light propagates through uh, space from one end to another and being scattered off by the different silicon nanoparticles. Now what happens if you have actually a much greater density of nanoparticles, uh, say you have 200 nanoparticles uh, dispersed randomly in space. Uh, so this is what is shown here. Uh, so light uh, will come in uh, and then we're gonna have also some, uh, some back scattering. So we have this backward scattering uh, from the nanoparticles, uh, from this uh, randomly distributed ensemble. Uh, and then we have this forward scattering that occurs within the, uh, the distribution of nanoparticle. Uh, now uh, you will see that this light scattering inside the distribution will propagate forward. Uh, however, the propagation is very slow. So uh, the, the larger the number of nanoparticles, the, the slower the the propagation of light, but it does propagate. You see some fields are propagating through. So if you actually let the simulation uh, run for a much longer uh, period of time, then you will see that light will propagate all the way through this ensemble of nanoparticle and reach the other side where it's actually going to scatter off uh, on the right in inside of this distribution. So now what happens if you actually organize uh, those nanoparticles in space on a, a very uh, periodic array of nanoparticles and send this exact same excitation uh, onto this, um, this nanoparticle distribution. Uh, so you're going to have an incoming plane wave uh, arriving at, at the same uh, wavelength of 750 nanometers. Uh, you're going to have uh, the wave going to be reflected. So this is a reflected wave that you see here. This is not scattering. You can see those uh, clear wave fronts, uh, the wavelength of this uh, reflected wave is the exact same as the wavelength of the incident wave, 750 nanometers. Uh, and inside this periodic arrangement of nanoparticle, now you have the formation of this plane wave. So this is, uh, there's no more scattering uh, occurring within this distribution, uh, as opposed to the randomly distributed nanoparticles. Uh, this is a plane wave. You can also see the wave front. And this uh, plane wave, which is transmitted through the periodic arrangement of nanoparticle, uh, we propagate from, uh, from the, the, the front end here all the way to the back end of this, uh, this array. Uh, so there's no scattering uh, occurring within or at the surface of this, uh, this uh, array. And you see that the transmitted wave is also a plane wave, which has the same wavelength as the incoming plane wave. So this is 
a plane wave which is being transmitted through the entire periodic distribution. This plane wave was 750 nanometers wavelength or 400 terahertz in frequency. Uh, now let's uh, look at uh, the exact same periodic array, uh, but now with a slightly different wavelength or slightly uh, different frequency. So now with this plane wave is at lower wavelength, 600 nanometers or higher frequency, 500 terahertz. So you see that now uh, we have this reflection and there's no light being transmitted through the crystal. So there's a, a total reflection of our incoming pain wave onto the surface of this periodic array and there's no transmission through the array uh, when we just change a little bit the uh, incoming uh, pain wave uh, frequency. So let's summarize what we've seen. Uh, so when we have only one single uh, light scatterer, so we have light scattering uh, occurring, forward and backward scattering. Uh, when we have multiple scatterers, then we have multiple scattering uh, events. This has been rise to more light being scattered uh, through uh, the ensemble of, uh, of nanoparticles. So it gives rise to very complex uh, local field distributions. Uh, now we actually have this periodic arrangement of nanoparticle uh, and you're saying the exact same optical excitation uh, at uh, 750 nanometers wavelength. Uh, we observe this uh, transmission of plane wave through, uh, through the, uh, the periodic arrangement, uh, giving rise to uh, a plane wave being reflected and the plane wave being transmitted. Uh, so those current beams that are propagating uh, within the, the periodic arrangement are occur without scattering or diffraction. Uh, the momentum, the light momentum is conserved. So there's a uh, clear momentum to see that light was coming with, the, with uh, this particular K vector normal to the surface. So it was still propagating with the exact same K vector uh, within uh, the periodic arrangement and the exact same K vector as it was propagating out of this periodic arrangement. Uh, then as we uh, shifted a little bit uh, the wavelength of excitation, then we had a total reflection. So there was no transmission through the structure. Uh, so this slight change in wavelength resulted in basically uh, preventing light from penetrating this periodic structure. So uh, this is what defines a photonic crystal. This is what uh, defines the interesting property of photonic crystal that we're gonna uh, discuss uh, later on. So in the end, photonic crystals are uh, materials uh, that exhibit a spatial uh, periodicity in their dielectric constant. Uh, in this particular case, it was uh, silicon uh, and air. Uh, so they exhibit various interesting properties, as I said. Uh, so this inhibition of light frequencies, uh, which is uh, resulting from the photonic band gap that we will introduce uh, later on. Uh, they, they show very interesting light propagation wave guiding properties. Uh, so we saw this conservation of momentum. Uh, something we're not gonna discuss, uh, but uh, she's also worth mentioning is that they exhibit nonlinear effect. Uh, and all of these are basically showing a uh, very high interest for technological applications. So photonic crystals have been first been discovered by uh, Lord Rayleigh uh, in 1887. Uh, so he demonstrated uh, very interesting properties of one dimensional photonic crystals. Um, it took about a hundred years to actually be able to, uh, to obtain a design uh, of uh, photonic crystals in 3D. This was done by Eli uh, Yablonovich so in uh, 1987. Um, photonic crystals are also uh, very interesting in the sense that they can uh, compare to uh, semiconductor electronics. Uh, and so I've done already a, a parallel between microelectronics and, and nanophotonics. Uh, this is another parallel that can be drawn. So in microelectronics, the, the whole purpose is to control uh, electric current within semiconductors uh, using their, uh, their electronic band gap. Uh, so this is the, the electronic structure of, uh, of silicon that shows the different electronic states uh, where basically the, the electrons can, can sit in and you have this uh, small range of energy where uh, no electronic states is, is actually available. So something similar can be done for photonic crystals. So this is a photonic band structure uh, rather than an electronic band structure 
uh, of a photonic crystal. And you have uh, basically those lines that we're going to discuss later on that uh, show what are the photonic modes available within this paradigm structure. And you have this range of energy where uh, no photonic mode is allowed. So within this range of energy, uh, no, no optical field can actually propagate through the structure. Uh, so this is what we've seen when we, when we tune the frequency of the incoming plane wave in the uh, numerical simulations before from 750 nanometers, which was uh, somewhere probably here, uh, all the way to uh, 600 nanometers, so we uh, with higher frequency, and then we fell into this photonic band gap, and therefore light was not allowed to propagate through the, the crystal. So in the end, photonic crystals can be seen as uh, semiconductors uh, for light. Photonic crystals uh, are very interesting in the sense that they can also be found in nature. Uh, so I'm going to uh, highlight a few examples of uh, photonic crystals in nature. Uh, some of the most obvious and most known examples are uh, the scales from uh, certain butterflies. Uh, so those scales, uh, they, they show uh, very uh, interesting uh, periodicity. So you have periodic uh, elements that are uh, repeating themselves and they give rise to very specific colors. So light can be actually transmitted uh, or uh, be totally reflected in this particular case at a very specific uh, wavelength. So in this particular case, light is un entirely reflected in the, in the blue region and can be transmitted in all the other regions. Other butterflies exhibit different type of uh, periodic structures. So you have some examples here of different periodic structures and that's what gives rise to different, to different colors of the, the butterfly wings. Uh, some of the other example, uh, also uh, fair, fairly known, the peacock. So the, the feather of the, the peacock is a bit very bright colors uh, from green, blue to brown. Uh, and all those colors can be actually studied here spectrally. So this is an, an optical reflectance uh, spectra that show the, the, the reflection from the, from the different uh, parts of the, 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 the peacock feather, uh, where do we have those different periodic structures uh, that reflect light at given specific uh, wavelength. Uh, some other examples, uh, the sea mouse or the, the diamond wither, uh, they have also periodic structures. So this is, for instance, on the spine, you have the spine of the, the, this, uh, the sea mouse and you have this periodic uh, array, uh, which is made of a void. So the, the spine itself is, uh, is made of chelin, uh, which is just a dielectric. And then you have those, those voids that are forming this periodicity. Uh, and uh, the, the, the spacing between those, those voids is 510 nanometers. We have nanometer scales, uh, structures that are uh, formed on the surface of the spines that give rise to those, those colors. Uh, the weevil is something very simple on, the, uh, on this uh, kitten filling uh, structure uh, with a lattice constant of 445 nanometers. So, uh, Maybe a less known example, but which is actually probably the most uh, impressive example of photonic crystals in nature uh, is coming from the chameleon. Uh, so this is something which is fairly recent. You see that uh, there's been some work on this has been actually published in uh, 2015. Uh, and this work published in Nature Communication has driven a drastic shift in, in thinking about how those chameleons actually can ch achieve uh, color changing. Uh, previously it was uh, considered the uh, chameleons were actually uh, modifying the pigmentation of their of their skin. And in fact, it occurs that this is the result of an active manipulation, an active tuning of the lattice uh, of uh, guanine uh, nanocrystals, um, which is uh, located within the superficial layer of the skin. Uh, so when uh, the male chameleon is actually relaxed, it shows uh, a very nice green color and was actually excited uh, because of the presence of a predator or uh, of a mate, is actually uh, turned to a brown yellow color. So what happens is basically under the skin, in a certain uh, layer of the skin, the, sec the second layer of the skin, you have actually a photonic crystal, uh, which is a square lattice. So this is a square lattice uh, composed of guanine uh, nanocrystals. Uh, those guanine nanocrystals uh, are actually of the order of 190 nanometers in, in size. And uh, what happens is that this crystal reflects blue light. 
So this crystal reflect light at about uh, 250, 300 nanometers wavelength. Uh, so you would say, okay, why in that case the chameleon is not blue? Well, simply because on the upper layer of the skin, uh, there are some yellow pigments. So the blue light being reflected from this nanocrystal with the yellow light being uh, reflected from the, the, the yellow pigments right, gives you a green color. Now when the, the chameleon gets excited, it's actually contracting uh, the different part of the skin and actually changing this squared array to an hexagonal array. The optical reflection goes from the blue region to the green region and back to the uh, orange or uh, even borderline red region. So then uh, when you have uh, those hexagonal array that reflect the red light with the uh, yellow light coming from, uh, from the pigment, then this gives rise to this orange coloration. So the, 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 the chameleon is actually able to tune actively his optical response to light uh, from the blue region to the, to the orange region going uh, through the, the green uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, and in, in, in addition to the, to the yellow pigments, which are just chemicals, then that's what's responsible for the, the, the change in coloration from green to uh, orange brown. So, photonic crystals exist in nature, I've just seen. So, uh, there are some examples from one dimensional photonic crystals where the periodicity is only one dimension or two dimensional photonic crystals, uh, all the way to each, uh, even three dimensional periodicity. Uh, so um, there are some references that have been listed in the previous slides that are also listed here. Uh, if you want to dive more into the details of uh, photonic crystals in, in nature. Uh, so now let's dive more into the, the physics of those photonic crystals uh, and, and see what, uh, what makes those photonic crystals uh, very interesting.